At this point, as we are concluding the series on missiological approach to understanding culture and worldview, in this video, we'll make a few comments about the power fear worldview and the supernatural. One of the things to comment on is that the Western understanding, sometimes we have this image and this idea of what the supernatural is, what the devil or Satan looks like, what do angels look like, and we've taken our ideas and understanding of the supernatural, not necessarily from scripture itself, but from later developments. Let's take angels, for example. Do they look like this? Or like this? Or even like these? Did you know that not once in the Bible are angels or messengers, as they're called, mentioned to have wings? It's the seraphim and the cherubim or the cherubim that have wings because they are creatures, divine creatures, and part of the spiritual beings. But messengers or angels do not. Some descriptions of them is that they have bright shining clothing and that they appear to be human, but also that they appear so imposing that people tend to fear them when they see them. But where do we get this idea of angels having wings? Well, some of the earliest inscriptions, because Christians wanted to inscribe them somewhere, in a cave or stone tablets, they couldn't just differentiate between humans and angels. And so they developed things like wings to depict someone from another world or another realm or from another dimension. That later further developed into the understanding, especially with the Dantes and the Enlightenment artists of the time, with a lot of art being created with angels depicted as having wings. And so naturally, over time, because of repetition, that became part of the Western psyche of what angels look like. Or take demons, for example. We don't really know what they look like, but we'll probably take our cues from Dante's Seven Circles of Hell, or even the devil having horns. But if we go back into scripture, I think it's a lot more nuanced in the understanding of the supernatural realm, especially regarding the fallen spiritual beings. The first comment is that Maybe we need to look back at the Jewish understanding of spiritual beings to be able to understand what the Bible is telling us about these devils or the adversary. And did you know that Satan is not a proper name? It's not supposed to be capitalized because the most common use in scripture in the Jewish and Christian tradition, the title for Satan has a definite article, the. Satan means accuser. But in the Bible, it's normally written as Hosatan, the accuser. Speaking of that main adversary of human beings, but definitely not the main adversary of God, who's not even close to being equal to God, but just one of the fallen spiritual beings, those who have rebelled. So this is my first comment about the Western understanding of power fear. Second, at least in my experiences in West Africa and as a Filipino growing up and hearing superstitions or the stories of Aswang and all of these spiritual beings that are taken from folklore and other stories, the obvious comment to make about them is to take them with a grain of salt. There is probably some truth in them, but we need to be cautious that we don't fall into the trap of believing it wholesale. But even more importantly, for us to be conscious of potential implications or unintended consequences for the people group in whom we are introducing the name of Jesus Christ. So here's an example of what I mean. In these videos that we've been making, I've been using King Jesus instead of Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. And there are several reasons for that. Firstly, Christ is actually his title, not his last name. Christ means anointed one or king or King Jesus. The second reason is that somehow in these power fear worldview cultures, the name Jesus, Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus becomes used as a name of power as part of their magical incantation or talisman for protection. In many practices of syncretistic Islam, for example, in what we call folk Islam, the name of Allah is written down on a piece of paper and that piece of paper is rolled up and put into some sort of small cylinder and that cylinder is part of this bracelet that is tied to a baby's ankle or wrist and this becomes part of a fetish, an object of protection for the baby and protection against evil spirits or the evil eye. And so when someone from a folk Islam or animistic background becomes a follower of Jesus, they will often hear missionaries or pastors say that we heal you in the name of Jesus and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And so the phrase in the name of Jesus 
becomes this syncretistic mantra that is repeated over and over again as a name of power. And this leads to syncretistic versions of Christianity. And there are already expressions of Christianity that treat the phrase and the name similarly. Their trust is in the name rather than the king to whom the name belongs. Did you catch that? So the trust is in the name itself rather than the person to whom the name belongs. When the Bible uses it, take Paul for example in Acts 16. He says to the slave girl's spirit that was inhabiting her. In Acts 16, Paul says, depart in the name of Jesus. That means that Paul is doing this because he has been given the authority by the one who has all authority, namely the all-powerful King Jesus. And so we have this authority because we have been given this authority by the King himself. And so when we do these things in the name of Jesus, we mean this not just as a statement of power, but we mean this as a statement to say that we have authority because we have been given this authority. And so we do these on behalf of, or by the instructions from, or by the will of the King. And so that's one reason why I use King Jesus instead of Jesus Christ, to help me remember that I need to be very careful when I introduce the King to cultures that are power, fear, worldview based. Because it has serious implications when we keep using the name of Jesus without really thinking, what does that phrase really mean? It's powerful, it's very true. But when taken from a power fear worldview, it gets kind of diluted and it becomes just part of their old ways, of their power fear fetish and incantations and superstitions. Now the third comment about the power fear worldview and the supernatural, when we look back in the past, we say, back in the day, no one really understood how the sun or the moon and the planets, how they all work. And so they used words and ideas which seem to us just ideas of magic in order to explain those phenomena. And because they realize that they're so small compared to those big things like the sun and the moon and the planets, and they have so little understanding that literally the sun, the moon and the stars became gods, little g gods, because they're so much bigger and so much more powerful. And so they depicted them with these ideas and imbued them with this idea of deity. And so the power fear understanding of the supernatural, people just take it for granted. They don't have to explain it. It just is. It's just there. They grew up with it. And sometimes as a people group, they are more sensitive to it than maybe we are. But those of us in the Western world, we kind of rationalize things. And so however true they might be, this phenomenon that they experienced, we explain it as magical or just powerful or supernatural and it seems like it's so much backwards than what we can explain with our rational and scientific points of view. Because now with the scientific revolution we can explain so many things using science and our current understanding. But then there are things even in our current understanding that we still don't know. So if we take for example fluid motion, how do these fire tornadoes happen? phenomenal. That to me is supernatural. Even though we can explain it using currents and heat. And let's take another example. The Bose-Einstein condensates. It doesn't naturally occur, but someone thought of their existence and even calculated their existence. And then 50 years later, someone was able to reproduce it using all these magical tools called magnetism and new techniques of cooling and using the laws of thermodynamics and using all of these rules and laws that we now know to be able to create this amazing particle with this amazing properties that could have potentially immense use and consequences. Because these Bose-Einstein condensates, they're neither solid, liquid, nor gas. The atoms vibrate at the same frequency and as a result, they can be in different places at the same time. A lot of this, you see, for normal lives is like magic. It's like these supernatural things are just taken for granted. So we don't have to be able to explain it, but in some worldviews, this is so natural to them that they don't need to explain it. But they do find a way, using language and ideas, to be able to explain it in their own terms. And so they use the vocabulary of supernaturals, of angelic beings, of spiritual beings. Whereas we might try to approach it by saying, we can explain that, or 
because we can't explain that, so that can't be real. But given our understanding of science, there is huge possibilities of many things that we still don't understand, that we just can't explain now or even comprehend, but could be in the future. And so we also have to be open to the idea that we may not necessarily completely or correctly perceive or understand things that people in different worldviews understand. So in my childhood, all these stories of Aswang and all these things in the Filipino culture or stories in West Africa that I mentioned about the spirits of having to offer fruit so that the spirits would give up the body in the waters, you can check out that video up here. And so that West African culture, they explained it not with scientific rigor, but with language and vocabulary that they were able to understand. All of these understanding may seem primitive to us, but we have to be open that there might be something deeper and something more that we don't understand in the matter of spiritual beings, both good and bad. And even these things that we perform on screen, on video, they might seem like magic, but they're just techniques. They're just things that allow us to be able to visually tell a story that might seem like magic, but in reality, they're just techniques. So even as we enter into this new year, we have just experienced Christmas. And even though Jesus is not technically born on that day, we celebrate the birth of the one who was born from a virgin and who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so we may not be able to understand or comprehend this. How could this be? But can we understand the message that this is a statement from God, a statement of power, that this Jesus, whom we'll learn more in the Bible, has been this amazing gift from God, but also the powerful manifestation of the being who loves and cares for his creation. This immensely powerful being who became human because he wanted to redeem it back to himself. And so that display of power not only has been from the very beginning, but also throughout Jesus' ministry and life. When he healed the sick, when he multiplied bread and fish to feed thousands, and his very resurrection. Can this idea of possibilities open up our eyes to the supernatural? To be able to see what we might not normally see and to be able to understand that this is the power of God. This is the power of God who loves, who will transform and who will do good on our behalf and for his honor and glory. And so that the world will know that this is the God who loves, this is the God who is generous, and this is the God who is gracious. And so with that, we conclude the series on the missiological approach for understanding worldviews. And so we actually made more videos than we had planned because we wanted to go deeper, not only to communicate it theoretically, but also biblically, as well as in real life. And so we hope you enjoyed all of these videos and hopefully you've learned some things. And if you'd like to make comments, even corrections or even additions, then those are much more welcomed in the comments below. So in the next series, we'll still be looking at understanding worldviews, but this time from the anthropological approach. And so again, like we did with this approach, we'll look at it first of all in general and theoretically, but then also biblically, as well as in real life. And we'll see you in the next video.